everyone. Welcome to our second annual last lecture at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. My name is April Overstreet and I'm the Director of Alumni Affairs here at UMMC. In my role in Alumni Affairs, I have the great opportunity to work with a volunteer student group who give of their time and energy, facilitating great, greater connections between alumni and students. This group, the Student Alumni Representatives, or STARS, that you see today in the Navy suits, um, host numerous alumni events, as well as give campus tours to alumni, donors, and other pers and prospective students, and represent UMMC to our external constituents. Um, as one of the few interdisciplinary groups on campus, um, this student organization wanted to leave a legacy here at UMMC by beginning a new tradition. So last year, um, this group, thanks to their leadership, we now have the opportunity to come together as a community um, to honor one of our uh, faculty that have been selected by students to give the last lecture each year at the end of our spring semester. So to tell you more about this year's last lecture and this year's selected speaker, I'd like to introduce Megan Henry, who is one of our STARS and last lecture committee members. Megan. Hello everyone, um, and as April said, we're so happy that you're here for the second annual last lecture series. Um, it's hosted by ASV Alumni Affairs and the Student Alumni Representatives. Um, just to give you a little background, the first ever last lecture was given by a man named Randy Pausch, a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in 2007, and it was given one month after he was given a terminal prognosis of his pancreatic cancer. He delivered a speech entitled, Really Achieving Your Childhood Dreams, and one year later, his talk was transcribed into a book, became a New York Times bestseller, and sparked a, transition, a tradition at universities nationwide of gathering students and faculty together and honoring an affiliate of the university to give a lecture on the premise of, if this were your only chance to speak to this group of people, what would you say? Um, so like April said, last year we started this you know, as an interdisciplinary program um, to have the hope of bringing um, not only students and alumni at UMC, but also encouraging interdisciplinary fellowship among all six and now seven schools at UMC. And in the context of UMC, getting all the disciplines together and across all career fields is a rarity in itself, so I think the um, topic fits fairly well here. I think an annual event such as this that brings everyone together to be encouraged in both our studies and in our work um, by someone who is doing just that in their everyday life can be a really great thing. We wanted to implement this here as a way to gather all of us together in the culmination of a school term and for students to honor a UMC affiliate who has impacted the school both professionally and personally. We look forward to seeing this event continue to be an annual opportunity for students to recognize people, their professors, mentors, and staff who have influenced them during their time here. This year, the students picked someone who emulates not only UMC's motto of education, research, and healthcare, but also someone who works tirelessly for his patients, his coworkers, and his students. We are so incredibly honored to have Dr. Brad Ingram as our second annual last lecture speaker. Um, Dr. Ingram is a native Mississippian who graduated from the University of Mississippi in 2001, earned his MD here at UMC in 2005, and completed his pediatric residency in 2008. He was chief resident in pediatrics and then completed his pediatric neurology residency at UMC, later serving once more as chief resident of the pediatric neurology program. He completed his training as a pediatric epileptologist at Cleveland Clinic in 2013 and then returned home to UMC as the state's only pediatric epileptologist. Dr. Ingram garnered quite a collection of awards along the path of his education, including, but not limited to, resident of the year, several years, Evers All-Star Resident, Holloman Award for Outstanding Pediatric Faculty, Pediatrics Fellow of the Year, Epilepsy Foundation Hero, Evers Attending Award, and UMC School of Medicine Trailblazer Teaching Award. He is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Child Neurology Society, American Epilepsy Society, and the Mississippi State Medical Association. He is a member of the Pediatric Education Committee, Vice President of the Epilepsy Foundation of Mississippi, President of the Professional Advisory Board of the Epilepsy Foundation and Mustard Seed Board member. He is the Director of the Epilepsy Foundation Professional Update. 
He frequently lectures to the first through fourth year medical students, pediatric and neurology residents, as well as to the clinical neurophysiology fellows. His lighthearted and memorable teaching techniques have made him a favorite of many a student that are in the medical center. He is a mentor for pediatric residents and medical students alike. He has been asked to speak at the Mississippi Statewide AAP meeting on multiple occasions, as well as the Southern Pediatric Neurology Society meeting, the Mississippi Student Athlete Health Forum, and the Arnold Peak Gold Humanism and in Medicine Induction Ceremony. Outside of his clinical accomplishments, Dr. Ingram has served in many different facets of volunteerism, both stateside and abroad. He has served in rural China and Peru. He is the board member for the Sunbeam Special Needs Children's Ministry and is a deacon of Pear Orchard Presbyterian Church. He has an affinity for camping and for Netflix. He and his wife, Maggie, live in Madison with their three children. Dr. Ingham currently serves as the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Associate Program Director of the Child Neurology Residency, Associate Program Director of the Clinical Neurophysiology Lab, M4 Assistant Clerkship Director for the Department of Pediatrics, and the Director of the Pediatric Epilepsy Program. Dr. Ingram has a way of making even the mundane fun and interesting. He motivates those that work with him and takes the time to encourage his students. He truly loves his patients, working tirelessly for them and for their families. He loves his wife and his family and brags about them often. He loves Mississippi and our people, and he takes the opportunity to serve them as an incredible honor. We're all a little better for working with him, and I'm so pleased to introduce the second annual last lecture speaker, Dr. Brad Ingram. Um, most of what she mentioned was court ordered, so um, it's, it's humbling to hear um, your investment in an institution and in people read out loud in front of a big group. Um, I want to thank the committee for choosing me for this honor. I want to thank all of y'all for being here. I am telling myself 100% it's for the Chick-fil-A, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> Um, but rarely do you have an opportunity to speak to everybody, right? Like, so this isn't just medical students, it's not just students, it's not just alumni, it's not just practicing physicians, it's dentists and pharmacists and nurses and health professionals from across the spectrum. So what a crazy honor and what a rare opportunity. So I'm very, um, very pleased to be here. When they asked me to give the last lecture, I was not familiar with it and I assumed that it would be followed by either a pink slip or a firing squad. <laughs> My nurse, who's sitting right over there, who's mortified, volunteered to be on the firing squad and requested specifically one of the guns that was loaded. So it's, um, we're not really sure what's happening in the parking lot after. I certainly am very humble to follow in uh, Dr. Jones' footsteps from last year and will say that this is probably a, a lecture best received as someone from their midlife crisis years. Um, I'm not pretending that I've got it all figured out. I'm 38 years old, hopefully I've got another 30 plus years of working, but I have made a lot of mistakes. And so today for me is about the last kind of 15 years of me in medicine, um, and then the next kind of 20 to 30 um, for what's next. Um, in my youth, my job was my passion, and I think that's a very typical thing that most of you would say. Your job is your, I'm going to close this laptop. Um, your job is your passion, right? When my mom, my sweet mom's on the front row right there, um, they still don't believe that I'm like gainfully employed, so I brought my parents to prove to them <laughs> that I have a job here. Um, when, my mom, when I was young and I was trying to get into professional school, mom used to teach nursing. And she said, here's the thing, when you're writing a personal statement, you always put what your passion is. Like, that's the core. And you say, my passion is dot, dot, dot. And you should totally use that, because it got me into like four residencies and medical school and the whole thing. So, um, but I identified my job as my passion, right? My passion was making Mississippi kids better. And my passion was making specifically Mississippi kids with epilepsy better. And there's nothing wrong with that statement. There's nothing wrong with being passionate. You should never lose being driven by your patients and wanting to make them better. But the problem with passion is that it can be a little dangerous, right? Like passion gives this kind of romance novel cover all-consuming concept. It's dangerous. It burns really bright and really hot, but it's not sustainable. 
And when people say, my passion is my job, that's great. But that's not sustainable, right? Um, when I was very young, well, not very young, when I was a very young resident, I should say, I did look 14. Um, <laughs> Dr. Kraut, who's the program director of the Department of Pediatrics, used to say that I was the resident in the program more, most likely to burn down the children's hospital. <laughs> because... I mean, I'm just fiery, right? And I had such an innate sense of justice. And if anything got in the way of my passion, I mean, there was wrath, right? And even as an M3, like, oh, I was so mouthy on rounds. I just had such a, a passion for this concept um, while at the same time identifying myself as a pediatrician. That's all I was. I was a pediatrician. I was married and had kids, but I was a pediatrician. That's what I was. And so one of the things that I want for us all to think about, and all the answers are different, and I'm not entirely certain that I have mine figured out, but I want us all to think today about what our purpose is. There's a lot of difference between passion and purpose. Um, I am very passionate about going to the beach this summer. Like, that is really... But my purpose is to come to work ready to work and ready to pour into my patients. My purpose is also to be the best husband, son, father that I can be, right? You see the difference between my passion is my job and what is my purpose? Your purpose is multifaceted. Um, and so that's one of the things that I want us to talk about today. What are the threats to our purpose as whole human beings? Um, my generation of doctors is very weird. We're very weird. We're not quite old enough to be part of the generation ahead of us. We're not quite young enough to be part of the generation that you're in. So when I started medicine, I mean, prepare for like the dinosaurs and uphills both way, right? Um, everything was on paper. Nothing was on computer besides x-rays. Uh, when you had a clinic visit, all the charts came to you in this buggy. And then you'd go find that chart and you would pull it out. And that's how you did your clinic note. Everything in the hospital was on paper. People died like flies. I mean, it was a terrible way to practice medicine. But that adjustment was very difficult, certainly for the generation ahead of me, but also my generation. And it's not just the what does my day look like that's changed, it's other things. The vast majority of you when you graduate, and for those of you who are residencies or are taking jobs, are not going out into Shibuta, Mississippi and opening a mom and pop doctor stand, right? It's not something that's easy to do. The vast majority of healthcare providers now are employees of healthcare systems, which has its positives, but it has a lot of negatives in the way that you interface with your job. I'm not the boss like I probably would have been 20, 25 years ago. I'm the employee. And that again, that's not all negative, but my ability to carve out what I want my life to look like is a little changed in that, right? Um, so now I want to talk about the main theme of today, in fact, figuring out what our purpose is, is probably the biggest threat to everyone in this room related to a long-term career in that new framework. Um, we in this country lose a medical school a year to physician suicide. 400 physicians a year commit suicide. Uh, physician suicide in residencies is on the rise. Medical student suicide is on the rise. We never really talk about it, right? We never really discuss what's happening to our healthcare folks. Um, and we need to have a forum to do that. We need to be in a position where we talk about how our job is affecting us and how, we're, how we should respond um, to the, those new pressures. It sounds, it just took a really dark turn. Everyone's face went. <sighs> um, that statement is super depressing, and it should alarm you. Um, but the, th the talk is about how we make it better, right? This is not a time for ostriches. We cannot bury our ha heads in the sands over this. We can't buckle down and work through that. We have to talk to each other, and that conversation needs to be multidisciplinary. So here we are, right? Um, I'm a big believer. I say to my kids all the time, do not solve a problem without knowing all the variables. You have to know all the variables. Information is power, know your variables. So today we're talking about variables. Um, and I firmly believe that your generation is a generation that will fix this. Y'all are smart, you're capable, you grew up in the system as it is, you will make this better. But not if nobody tells you it's a problem, right? Um, how many people 
I hate these because I imagine what I would have felt like when I was 23 and saw this. How many of you, you don't have to do a show of hands, you can if you want to, uh, have seen on Facebook polls like, or comments like, I would never do medicine again. Anybody? Have y'all, I mean, my generation, it's like every other post. That's because I'm friends with people that are my generation. Um, but there are some very interesting studies out there. I mean, this is web, this is data-driven, right? Evidence-based medicine. So we go to WebMD, where all best evidence-based medicine is. Um, 24,000 doctors, so a lot. We can agree that's a lot. 25 specialties, only 54% of them said they would choose medicine again. And this was in 2012. In 2011, the year before, 69% said they would choose medicine again. So that curve is going like this. And that's doctors. That's not medical students or residents. Um, the reality of medicine, though, is that they're not saying that because they don't want to take care of patients anymore. The reality of medicine is they're saying that because their job is no fun anymore, right? Um, people ask me sometimes, would you do medicine? Of course I would do medicine again. Where else do you get to be around people in this vulnerable of a position with this much impact to do good? There's no other career on the planet that is better than being with people when they're as broken as they are when they're sick. Also, I have crippling ADD and can't do anything with my hands. So this is pretty much it for me, right? Um, but it's a privilege. It's a privilege. We should look at medicine still and see nothing but as um, a PICU attending texted me yesterday about one of my AG reads, butterflies and rainbows. That's what we should see. This is such an opportunity um, to make the world a better place. Don't lose that. You came to UMC with that. Don't lose that. And don't let us beat that out of you. Um, so where does all of this come from? The big word that we use in academic medicine is burnout, right? And y'all have probably all heard the term burnout. Um, I like that word. I think it describes what's going on well. The other word that we use to describe it is wellness, which to me sounds like a clinic in a mini mall, strip mall, where you would go get B12 shots. Um, <laughs> I like that we should use a dirty word. Wellness sounds like something they've got spa music playing in the background. I want a hard word. So burnout is this combination, so it's a triad, okay? Burnout is basically, and there's tons of big words. There's all these articles in JMA if you want to read about it. But it's basically emotional exhaustion. Anybody in the room emotionally exhausted? Like it's Wednesday, right? Um, <laughs> cynicism and hostility. For those of you who are on your clinical rotations, you have all experienced cynicism and hostility. Even if it not was, was not inside of you, you've experienced it. And a negative self-evaluation. Self so the negative self-evaluation is when you're laying in bed at night at the end of the day or you're waking up in the morning and you say to yourself, is this really my purpose? Is this really why I did this? What am I really doing with my life? That's, negative. So the, that's, what, that's the triad of burnout, right? Interestingly, healthcare providers, especially physicians, have, because burnout's not unique to medicine, our reasons are unique, but if you compare us to other careers outside of healthcare, we don't get negative self-evaluation, probably because so many of us have a narcissistic personality disorder, right? Um, as compared to other careers. But those are the three things. And why do we get burnout? If you want to boil it down to, oh my gosh, Jesus, that's big words, nobody cares, oh, I should take them to the of life. Two things. And you, this is such a helpful framework for you when you're on rounds, when you're about to teach Sunday school, when you and your spouse get into a spot, a spat, when you and one of your coworkers aren't getting along, when it's like a Saturday night and your pager will not shut up. These are the two things that you need to look at. One is, am I, am I getting the reward that I was expecting? Is my job, is my purpose fulfilling what I thought it was going to be? And number two is how much autonomy do I have over my world? So that goes directly to what we were just talking about, about healthcare changing. Um, is that my pager? That's not my pager, is it? Somebody's pager. Hopefully it's not mine, because I'm not. Is it my pager? Um, I gave it to my wife because I didn't want it to go off during my speech. Um, so autonomy is the sense of I'm in control of my day. And that's not 
what we as physicians and people who are graduating now are experiencing because we're employees more than we are in control. You as students and residents, zero. Nobody cares about what you think, right? <laughs> zero autonomy. And how many of you come to medical school or to dental school or to nursing school or to pharmacy school with this picture in your head that day one you're going to be like rocking the stethoscope and the little white coat and walking around with your doctor's bag, just healing folks, right? And then you get here, and that is not what professional school is, right? Even when you get into clinical years, you're like, I don't even know if I'm on the right floor of this building, right? <laughs> This is, what, this is why you guys are at such risk for developing these habits because you have no autonomy and you have no reward. And when people have no autonomy and no reward, they act like buffoons, right? They do crazy things. They're grumpy with each other. They yell for no reason. They throw scalpels across the operating room. They do awful, awful things. It's one of those two things. Every time I've misbehaved in my life, we've talked about this, my wife and I have, it's been because one of those two things didn't happen. And when my passion to be a good doctor was the only thing about me, one of those was always messed up. So I was always just awful to be around. I was always just on about something. Ask yourself, what am I not getting when you don't feel like you're being fulfilled? Um, when all of the stuff with UMC was happening with the budget stuff, and I know that y'all are kind of removed from that a little bit, but we as physicians are not at all. It affects us, it affects our patients. A lot of times I come to work and Epic doesn't work and I feel like an IT tech, right? Not a doctor. And so for a very brief period that was terribly obnoxious, I made everyone in the clinic refer to me only as healer. Um, <laughs> which was very tongue in cheek, because guys, I'm just writing prescriptions, okay? Um, it was tongue in cheek, it was meant to bring a moment of brevity, you see now that's things like that that make my nurse want to be on the firing squad to kill me, right? Um, but I would only respond if you address me as such. But I needed to be reminded, right? Like, I'm not here to be data entry. I'm here to be a doctor. And that sort of thing is the kind of thing that we need to circle back and remind ourselves to when we're feeling great feelings of vulnerability and distress. Um, this burnout thing is not a minor thing. It's not going away. It's a massive issue in physicians. 50% um, of physicians will report being burned out at some point in their career. And it has to do with an ever earlier and earlier and earlier age of average physician retirement because they're burned out and they can't do it anymore. There is some variability. Pediatrics, unsurprisingly, is the second in people who are not burned out. Uh, that's because we're the best. Um, <laughs> Fields like emergency medicine where you can imagine they're just getting hammered tend to have the highest. So it ranges between 30 to 70% in any, in, over across medicine. Um, but imagine if you go to an emergency room and there's three doctors there and two of them are burned out. That's pretty impressive. Um, and we've all got student loan debt so none of us can just quit working. So we push through and or make everyone around us miserable. Um, so I want to ask the question, does that sound like you? Because, and it's not just old people who get burned out. Now I'm ready for my one PowerPoint slide. I want, you know, I do not believe in using PowerPoint unless you absolutely have to. Can you all see that? I purposefully left the, like, what it is off of it. Any guesses on what that is? You see women and men there. I had someone say, this is the best way to turn a woman into a man one time when they were looking at this slide. Because the top is the women and the bottom is the men. And the bottom woman, by the time you get to M4 year, now has the same score as a male did when he was an M1. Any guesses what this is? This is, M this is medical student empathy. And everyone goes, oh my. Well, what an interesting study. Over and over and over again. The data always points to, we break you during medical school. And we break the whole reason you came to medicine in the first place. We killed your empathy. Um, this is heartbreaking for me. This is not like what it's supposed to look like. This is not about a generational thing where this is how we do it because we've always done it. This is awful. Everyone in this room should be ashamed at what they see here. 
And if you're a student at this institution, you should be like, Whoa. and you should be doing a lot of self-interest, self-self-evaluation, right? Um, because, all right, you can turn it off. That is literally the only slide I have in my talk. Oh, here's one more. Never mind, I lied. <laughs> I lied. Because here is, again, um, M1, M2, M3, M4, and this is people who cheat and misbehave, right? And guess what happens? Look at their, as they go up, this is, it's not uh, M1, M2, this is just medical students in general, and how many infractions they have. Um, but these two little dots and triangles there, that little curve, that's emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. That's burnout in medical students. So medical students who are burned out and lose their empathy, cheat more, misbehave on rounds more, and guess what? The people who are at between at three or greater during medical school have a much higher rate of not being able to hold down a job and having their medicine, medical license suspended with their state medical boards. And we do that. Now, some of that's on y'all, but I'm not responsible for you cheating. But, um, but that's something that we need to be talking about and thinking about, right? That's a big deal. That, that we, are, we are breaking the empathy of the people that we train. And empathy is what we would all say goes into things like professionalism and is what, what really matters about why you came to healthcare in the first place. Hold on a second. I got out of order. Okay. Now, there are going to be a lot of times where you don't feel like you're in control, and that's part of being a healthcare doctor. You've got to learn to, to develop coping skills and work through that. But there are going to be a lot of times where you have to be flexible, right? You have all worked with people that you look at them and go, I would not want that person to be in my mama's doctor. Or I would not like that person to be in my exam room. Or, oh my goodness, how are they still employed here because of the level of their misbehavior? Um, those are not the people who you need to be getting mentored by. Those are not the people you need to look at and go, I'm going to be just like him because I want to throw scalpels when I get older too, right? Um, miserable healthcare providers, burnt out healthcare providers, make for miserable patients. And they also have significantly worsened healthcare outcomes. So this is not just about how happy you are to drive home at the end of the day. At least some of this is about the quality of care your patients will receive. Um, I want to tell you a, t a story about me, again, as an intern. This will illustrate to you my level of misbehavior when I was an intern. And I, I want you to hear it from the ears of, I was not getting my reward, and my job was not expected, was what I expected it to be. So I came to medical school to be a pediatric epileptologist. I have epilepsy. That was my dream from day one, was to be a pediatric epileptologist. So I've always veered towards the peds neuro. When I was an intern, my very first night on call, I get a page from one of the floor nurses at 11 o'clock. So I'm an intern, a little anxious, first night on call. My job is not what I thought it was going to be, right? And the nurse says, hey, Brad, we need your help finding our three-month-old. Now, those of you who do not specialize in peds, three-month-olds can't walk. So um, I said... Well, where did you last see it? I mean, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> so she said, no, no, no. Mom left with the baby. It's 11 o'clock at night. Now, what you need to know about this baby is that this baby was admitted to my service. They were three months old. I had done my probably first successful lumbar puncture on this three-month-old. So I'm riding high, right? Diagnosed the baby with herpes encephalitis. Appropriately dosed the acyclovir. I'm not doing a good job, right? Um, <laughs> Have this baby all figured out, like, I am on it. This is my kid. And I saved its life, right? Don't we feel good about my job performance? So we call a code pink. It's 11 o'clock at night. We're wandering all around. I find them in the parking lot in front of Methodist walking to Yazoo City in a little red Batson wagon with the baby's acyclovir hanging from one of the IV poles. It's 11 o'clock at night. She's got a three-month-old. And I go get her, and I bring her in, and I am just... Furious. How dare I have taken such good care of your baby? How dare you do that, right? And um, I kind of step back because I'm the intern. I don't really know what to do. And this is so interesting. It's like my closest Mari Povich moment ever, right? <laughs> so my upper level goes over, and my upper level, who is this like stone cold Cajun from Woods, he did not care, right? 
So the mom is screaming at my upper level, who I identify as self, right? She and I are a team. You come after her, you come after me. And the mom is screaming at this upper level. I've got five kids. How many kids do you have? You don't have any kids. I know about raising kids. Da, 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 da. And I get between them and just full on howler monkey, right? Like I am. <laughs> um, I'm calling a judge, and you can't leave. I'm gonna get the police to arrest you. And I mean, I am full on doing it. Um, and the mom looks at me and says. They told me my two-year-old couldn't stay, and I can't leave my baby. And I'm like, whoa. I look down. There are two kids in her wagon. I didn't even notice the two-year-old. And this poor mother had gotten from hospital policy and from the nurses, your two-year-old can't stay. And rather than working to fix that, right, she was like, fine, I'll just take both of them and leave and walk home. Now, in that moment, that tall, right? I feel that tall. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I was successful with that lumbar puncture. It doesn't matter if I, I mean, all of this is patient safety, so of course it matters. But what mattered to that mom was the two kids in her wagon, not the one. And I, me, big old me that was so important, it wasn't getting my autonomy needs scratched, right? Like, I'm not in control of the situation and you're not rewarding me with the love and respect that I deserve kind of situation, completely miss the fact that in that moment, that's not about me. It is not about me. And that is the number one problem with healthcare today, is that when you come to work, regardless of what you do, it is not about you. It can't be about you. Because, like I tell that, and that's like a funny story from 12 years ago. That was the worst thing that ever happened to that woman, right? And I look back on things as like a random Tuesday afternoon. And these are, we deal with people in their most vulnerable, most fragile, most broken places. And it is never about you, ever. The whole thing about I want to be a healer and I want to be, make the world a better place. You should acknowledge that. But one-on-one -on -one with your patients, it's not about you. If you are looking for your patients to stroke your ego and to make you feel better, when you walk into a patient care scenario, nobody cares about you. And they shouldn't, because what matters is that person sitting across the table from you. Last week I was on call, and um, my, I call her my life counselor, my wife, who has been working with me on work-life balance. Um, <laughs> she should bill for the hours that we talk about, it, actually. Um, she, my son had a baseball game. He is the best, the most exciting thing about him on the planet is being shortstop of, an, of a third grade baseball team. That is the most exciting thing about him. He could drop out of school, live with us forever. As long as he gets to play third grade baseball shortstop, he's fine. <laughs> um, so I know I've got this baseball game at 5.30, and I'm a bad father because I can't coach because I'm at work all the time. But I've got to be at his games, right? My resident, sweet Megan, I saw her. Where is she? There she is, sweet Megan, wonderful neurology resident. Um, was post-call, so she went home. I got five consults. 11 o'clock, done. 1 o'clock, done. 2 o'clock, done. 3 o'clock, done. And I'm going, that's my four, right? That's my day. I'm going home. 4.30, here's the emergency room. They've got a uh, uh, 19-month-old in the emergency room who has had three seizures for we can't explain why and is about to get intubated. So I run downstairs, and still, this is not something that I know, guys. This is something we have to work on all the time. I will run downstairs, oh, no, I'm late to Parker's baseball game, and I'm a terrible father, and then he's going to become like a gigolo, and it's going to be all my fault because I missed the baseball game. <laughs> you know? And I walk in the room, and it's immediate. Like, this is not about you. Dad has tears pouring down his face. Mother is in the corner, hugging her knees and rocking back and forth because they are so catastrophically affected by what to me is like a fifth consult that day, right? They, what, he wasn't necessarily that much sicker than some of the other ones I got that day. But for them, oh my word, right? And I walk in, I'm like, ah, he just needs a lumbar puncture. It's fine, no big deal, right? We can't be like that. We can't be like that. We have to remember when we go into that situation, they don't care if I have four consults that day, and they do not care about my son's baseball game. What they care about is their poor little, they don't really care about me at all. They care about their poor little 19-month-old, who
who had a seizure at daycare and then another one in the car and then another one in the emergency room. And they have no background or basement to deal with this. So if it's not about us, then that's great, right? The message is over and we go home right wrong. Um, you can't be a good doctor or a good whatever if you're empty. You can't come to this job empty because we just talked about how you have to pour into people, right? And if you're a vessel and you're empty, what are you going to pour into them? Nastiness, awful things. Um, so you've got to recognize that your purpose is not your job. Your you is not your job. Who you are is not your job. The people on Facebook that are always asking me questions about stuff seem to think that my job is what I exist for. But that is not true. You are not your job. That is something that I really wish someone had said to me when I was 22, 23 years old. You should be the best at your job, but you are not your job. Nobody else is out there thinking, I'm a bank teller, and that's what I am, right? Like nobody, <laughs> nobody does that but, but us. We do that to ourselves, right? Um, it's really funny. I wrote kind of the brass tacks of this talk, and then I went to an AAMC meeting where we had a lot of lectures on wellness, um, which are the same thing. I just really don't like that word. Uh, it was 420. Does anyone know what 420 is famous for? <laughs> Got it. Tell your friends if they don't know. So I'm in a college town that shall remain nameless, and there is, I'm walking up and down this really lovely downtown area, and there is a six foot three gentleman there in a pink bunny suit who is passing out um, samples. And they're all real relaxed. So I'm wandering around that, and I think, geez Louise, I'm going to have like a spot drug test when I get back, and it's going to test positive for weed, and i got to get away from this. So I wander by, and I've just had three days of wellness, and you need to tell your medical students about wellness, and they need to learn about resiliency, and they learn about wellness. And I walk by this woman who is selling those things, those magnets that you put on your fridge, and they're seashells where they have a plant in them. You know what I'm talking about. They sell them at like every kiosk, at every outlet mall ever. You know what I'm talking about. So it's like an air plant. You don't water it. You don't do anything to it. You just put the magnet on your fridge. I'm convinced they're plastic, but they didn't ask me. So, and the main selling point from this woman, after I've just left three days of we need to pour into ourselves from outside our jobs, is you don't have to do anything to this. You don't have to water it. It doesn't need anything. All it's going to do is be there waiting. She said this to me. I'm not kidding. All, like it's a dog. All it's all you got to do. It's going to be there when you get home to welcome you to start your day at home. <laughs> I'm pretty convinced the bunny rabbit guy had been to her first. But um, you guys, you can't be an air plant. You are not an air plant. We raise you in, in professional training to be air plants. We raise you in professional training to be the best. Our attendings walk around, and we, we do not want any chinks in our armor because we are the best. Our nurses, our pharmacists, our respiratory therapists, our dentists, they are the best. And if you are vulnerable in any way, then it will... Your generation can't function like that. That doesn't work in a system where you're an employee. Um, so if you haven't been listening, take on point, don't be an airplane. Um, so how do we do this? How do we make our, how do we fill ourselves if we can't fill ourselves with our job? Um, one of the things that you need to be thinking about as a neuroscientist, you know, many of you who are under 26, your brain is not fully developed yet. So if you're under 26, your brain's still working on it, okay? That means you don't necessarily have your adulting together yet. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. It's okay, I know 46 year olds who don't have their adulting together yet, so, and they don't have their brain maturity as an excuse. This is a time in your life where you need to be working on coping skills. You need to be thinking actively about how do I cope with things. If you don't know how to cope with things, if you don't have coping skills, you need to find someone to help you do that. And you need to do that with your head held high and you need to say, I got stuff I don't know how to process, and it's time for me to process it and learn how to be an adult and move on with it, right? You need to be thinking of that just as important as microbiology, right? This is something you have to learn how to do. I'm convinced it's the reason the M3 year exists, is to teach you medicine, yes, but mostly how to cope in healthcare. That's why the M3 year exists. Um, figure out your purpose. If you came here today and you're like, I'm here for the Chick-fil-A and this dude, and maybe he'll make me laugh a little bit, but you have no idea what your purpose is in life, it's time for like a dream journal, guys, right? Not really, I don't care if you do a dream journal, but 
it's time to do some self-reflection. It's time for you to sit down and think about what is my purpose on this planet. I did not really do that until I was about 32, 33 years old. I was in fellowship or residence until I was 35. So I just hid behind my job for all of my 20s and for probably the first 10 years of my marriage. And it was not fair to my family or to my wife or to my kids. You need to know what your purpose is on this planet. And it is not to be a straight-A student at this institution. That may be your short-term passion, but that is not your long-term life purpose. For me, a lot of this is easy because it comes from my God, right? Like, none of this is internal. All of this is external. Something's got to pour into you. For me, that's all about faith. And knowing that someone bigger and more important and smarter than me has control over it takes a lot of this stuff off my plate, right? It helps be Presbyterian because we believe in predestinationism, so it's all meant to happen anyway. We would love to have you at our church at 8.30 on Sundays. But, um, but that, for me, has been my shortcut. Um, it also helps to have significant family support. I would not be where I am without those four people plus the other two that are at school right now because they the chemist school. Um, I wouldn't be there without those people, right? You would not be here if it weren't for your parents and your family and the support of your friends. Make friends that are not medical. Go to the gym this afternoon and if someone says, oh, I work at UMC in the pharmacy, then you walk away, right? <laughs> you need to go find somebody that's like, a landscape architect, or you know who's super fun to be with is accountants because they get really stressed out in April and y'all are kind of winding down in April and it's super fun to watch somebody else go through that. So go find an accountant. And that goes on for the rest of their lives, April 15th. Um, make friends. Have a support system. You cannot do this alone, I promise. And guess what? Even if you are flawless for the two or four years that you're at UMC and you are flawless working your way through residency, you're going to wake up and you're going to be 30 and all of that's going to be gone. You need a support system. You need, if not family, you need to make a family. You need to not like physically make a family. You need a <laughs> group of people. Because kids are not born to love you guys. They don't. They want you to love them, right? So you need to surround yourself with people. Um, probably the most important part of that, marry the right people, guys. And ladies. Marry the right people. Do not marry somebody if you do not think that they will be your partner in life. You all are at ages where that becomes a, a bigger thing, right? Like that's a thing we think about now. If we're not already married, we're headed towards it. I married Maggie before my M3 year. Um, smartest thing I ever did. I'd probably be in prison right now if it weren't for her. Um, marry the right people. Choose smartly. Surround yourself with smart people. Because if they're not resilient, if they need and need and need and take and take and take, your marriage will not make it. In my class in medical school, there was a, a young man who was married and divorced three times in four years. Now, he had terrible taste in women. But, um, <laughs> but that's a thing. Like, you need to acknowledge that. So you need to foster and grow your relationships outside of job. It does help to marry people who are not medical, by the way. Because Maggie doesn't really care about what's happening in my job every day. She just wants to support me and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so very quickly, I said I was going to finish at 1245. Um, this is not, this place is not where you're going to find your you. You need to be working on your compassion. And you need to be working on your patient-centeredness. And you need to be working on educating those who are underneath you. And you need to be working on being the best that you can be. But you will never be any of those things if you're empty. Don't be an airplane. Thank you all very much.